Does inflammation accelerate cancer? Yes, this is, this is, this is generally appreciated now that cancer develops uh, in, in cases where there is a chronic inflammatory reaction because here's what inflammation is. Inflammation is basically your immune system's first response against infection. I mean, we talk about antibodies. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you get immunized so your body can make antibodies against polio or antibodies against uh, various bacteria, diphtheria, tetanus, all of those things. Uh, antibodies, specific antibodies, which target particular microbes, take weeks for your body to be able to make after the initial exposure, and then if you're vaccinated or if you get the disease, a second exposure can be done much quicker, but it's not immediate. So what happens when you get that, when you step on that rusty nail that might give you tetanus, uh, or, or you get a flea bite from a rat that's infected with bubonic plague, if you don't have any specific immunity? Well, you might die from it, but meanwhile, you might not, and in the meantime, your body is going to be throwing whatever it can at it by way of first responders, a nonspecific immunological reaction where you get these activated white cells, macrophages they're called, they get activated and they start throwing out poison darts and fireballs and all of that on a molecular level to kill anything that might come in before it kills you. And in the process, it does a lot of damage. That's inflammation. Mm -hmm. Now, nowadays, with the typical glycine deficient diet, inflammation happens just as a response to tissue injury because it's too, the cells that cause it are too much on a hair trigger. They're overactive and they go, they go into action causing inflammation when they shouldn't. Well, tissue injury happens all the time. Tissue injury on a micro level happens in your circulatory system. Wherever there's a branch in an artery so you naturally get turbulence, you naturally get micro injuries. And if they build up and if there's inflammation chronically happening from micro injuries at these branch points in your circulatory system, like where your coronary arteries branch off, you end up with a heart attack. Like where your carotid arteries branch off, you end up with a stroke. Or where your renal arteries branch off, you end up with malignant hypertension. So this is the chronic inflammation in places like that causes cardiovascular disease. It, that is appreciated. But why that happens is generally not appreciated. And I understand now that that's mainly due to glycine deficiency. So glycine deficiency, we, uh, I, before you said we, our body has a, an abundant amount of it, and yet now you're saying because of the food we eat these days, we're, we're there's not, not, we're enough not getting enough glycine. Well, there's, there's plenty of glycine in the collagen of your body. It's the most abundant protein, the most, most abundant amino acid in your protein but also as a single soluble amino acid. Just like methionine and a number of other amino acids, it has other metabolic roles besides being a building block for protein. And in the case of glycine, that metabolic role is to regulate inflammation and some other things. And so usually the, the free amino acid, not as part of a protein, but just the free soluble amino acid, is normally present in high concentrations in your blood and other body fluids but typically it's not high enough. So we tend to experience chronic inflammation. So I, I feel so strongly about this, I actually, uh, you know, I actually set up natural food science and I have it available. I, I have a product called Sweetamine, actually. Uh, Maybe we could and, get a close-up you know, of that or? I don't know, that's, that's just one form of it. You know, that's, mm -hmm. um, uh, that's available on the website, naturalfoodscience.com or sweetamine.com. Or, you know, this is, you can get just plain glycine and not as, a, not as a tasty formulation necessarily. What I did is I put it in a formula so that it's tasty for, uh, for people to just put it, you know, one, one packet a day in a cup of coffee or tea. And you use it just like a sweetener, but it's, it actually gives you 8 grams of glycine, which is about as much as you'd probably throw away by not eating the bones and connective tissues of the meat, fish, and poultry that you otherwise eat. So with it, it's not so much what you don't eat, or it's not so much what you eat that causes inflammation, it's really what we don't eat. And in fact, uh, I believe that 
one of the reasons why, you, you've, no doubt you've heard cases like this or maybe experienced it. You go to the hospital because you have some complaint, some persistent pain. And they say, well, we're going to admit you to the hospital for tests. And so they wake you up in the middle of the night and they do blood tests and they do scans and they do all kinds of testing. And they say, you know, after a few days or a week of that, they say, well, you know, we, we can't find anything. And then miraculously, though, you seem to feel better, at least. And then they send you home. Well, what did they give you for dessert? after your every meal at the hospital, if you know Pudding. what hot. I don't or know. Jello usually. Oh, Jello. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows the hospital, <laughs> hospital meals have Jello for dessert. Jello is gelatin. Gelatin is collagen. I mean, for example, this eight grams a day that you would get in sweet amine or, or just by taking eight grams a day of glycine is the equivalent of having about 16 servings a day of, of uh, Jello. Wow, that's very... And, and I, people generally are so glycine deficient, they have a couple of servings a day of Jello. they get a gram or two a day of glycine, they will actually feel better. Just like some scientific studies have actually shown that, yes, if you have grandma's chicken soup, it will, it, you, you will speed the healing and, and shorten the course of colds and flu and, and, and heal better, and that's true. Mm -hmm. See, inflammation actually retards healing. When you sprain your ankle, and everybody knows, oh, you sprain your ankle, so now it's swollen and painful and immobilized and all of that, and everyone thinks it's normal, but why should that happen? Why should your body need to put ice on it in order to slow down its normal reaction to that so that you can heal? In other words, the normal reaction that the body has to blunt injury or burn injury or most injuries is not healthy. It's not helping. Healing, it retards healing. Putting the ice on a sprained ankle? I mean, I thought the... Well, yeah, that's what, what you need, yeah. Rest, uh, something, uh, cold, and something else that was... Yeah, like cold, well, the ice, yeah, that's one of the things. Some so, of the... Uh, you know. The point is you, you, that your body I, I, is you reacting in a way that is counterproductive when you have a typical injury because the typical diet is really glycine deficient. Now, there are a couple of other nutrients, too. There are, um, everyone talks about omega-3 fatty acids. Right? Everybody knows about omega-3 fatty acids. They also have an important role in the inflammatory process. Um, over 20 years ago in the classroom, in my biology classroom, they used to call me Professor Walnut because I used to talk about omega-3 fatty acids and walnuts as a perfect source of food, a perfect and complete food. And I realized it takes decades from any major scientific discovery before it actually gets out there into the public consciousness. So that's why I figured, well, I could make it available by setting up a website and a company. So, you mm -hmm. know, that would make it easy for people to get it and just to talk about it uh, and also to write about it. I am also uh, doing some research as uh, some uh, animal research with a, a research foundation on rats some on mice, hopefully with the uh, National Institute on Aging. Uh, we're hoping to do a, a very, very large study in three different centers on lifespan in mice, and also some clinical trials uh, uh, with my son, who's actually a, a cardiology fellow at a major hospital in New York, to do studies on uh, diabetics and heart patients to see how uh, supplementation with sweetamine, with glycine, will actually uh, help them. So uh, this being a, a show that wants to uh, extend life. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's right. It's all about protection of life. life but, but, yeah. Yes, from, from conception to natural death. And I know we're usually focused on saving the lives before birth because that's where they are most vulnerable these days. But uh, saving someone from getting sick and dying in their 50s and 60s from uh, diabetes and heart disease and cancer, that's, that's a very, uh, very important activity in preserving life. And I think that's all valid medical research is, is about protecting and preserving human life. So, well, Let me ask you about diabetes. How, how would uh, this additional glycine help a, a diabetes patient to retard the gradual oh. effects of diabetes during their lifetime. I'm glad you asked because uh, actually there are clinical trials of this. There's some animal studies and also uh, a study done in um, Mexico City about five years ago on diabetic patients. And it not only helps to deal with the effects of diabetes, it actually helps to reverse diabetes. The reason is this. We all know now, everyone uh, in medical research and many in the public understand that diabetes is often a consequence of having a little too much abdominal fat, right? Mm -hmm. And it may not show on camera right now, but I got, <laughs> I got a few extra pounds of it myself. 
And everyone knows uh, in research that, that it's the, uh, yes, it's the <laughs> abdominal fat, not just, you know, fat in the buttocks or, you know, subcutaneous fat elsewhere, but it seems to be that abdominal fat that leads to diabetes. And the question is why? Well, it's not so much the fat cells, but within that abdominal fat, there are a lot of inflammatory cells. And so one gets to a case of what's called metabolic inflammation, which shows up as insulin resistance, and then it shows up as type 2 diabetes, elevated blood sugar and diabetes. And it, it's probably because the beta cells, the cells in the pancreas that make the insulin, get attacked by these activated macrophages by a process of metabolic inflammation that is uh, reversed, actually, when there is enough glycine. There was a very uh, interesting study done on um, what's called metabolomics, where they, these days they do scientific studies that are called data-driven, where they take blood samples or tissue samples, and they measure everything. You know, they measure hundreds of different metabolites, hundreds of different proteins, hundreds of different genes. In this case, they measured hundreds of different metabolites, and they found that when they compared middle-aged people who had insulin resistance, pre-diabetes, to age-matched population of people who did not have insulin resistance, guess what the biggest difference was in their blood? The ones with insulin resistance had much less glycine in their blood. 